Hello, everybody. <clears throat> it's Monday, and unfortunately, the Zoom lecture that I did this morning that I covered a lot of great material in, I couldn't get the video to convert, and so I don't know if I'm going to be able to upload it. <sighs> I emailed Zoom. I uploaded them the files. They're going to try and convert it, but I'm not 100% confident it's going to convert. So I want to just give you a quick little 10-minute recap of what I covered today. So, you know, in Chapter 9, we were looking at this whole work energy model where work done on a system changes the total energy of the system. And what we finally came up with at the end was this whole, the work done, and this is the work done by all external forces, equals the change in energy of the system. And in Chapter 9, we weren't looking at potential energies and interactions between objects. The only forms of energy we were looking at kinetic energy and thermal energy. So kinetic energy, energy of motion, one half mv squared, and thermal energy is generated anytime there's friction or air resistance. It's basically heat. How much thermal energy increases is given by the force of kinetic friction times the displacement over which it acts. In chapter nine, we also looked at work for a constant force where the force is constant in both magnitude and direction, the work is just the dot product of F, the force, dotted into the displacement delta R. From that, we saw the work done by gravity is equal to negative mg times delta y. That minus sign is because the force of gravity is in the opposite direction of the displacement when something is moving straight up. And so when delta y is positive, the work done by gravity is negative and the work done by gravity is positive when an object moves down because gravity acts down, the displacement is down, the angle between the force and the displacement is zero. In chapter 10, now we're dealing with interactions. And on Wednesday, I posted a big sort of video where I pretty much covered all of chapter 10. But let me review it. One conservation, not conservation of energy, potential energy is always an interaction between two or more objects. So you probably remember gravitational potential energy, elastic potential energy from high school physics or physics 11. I can't have one object having potential energy. It's always, in terms of gravitational potential energy, an interaction between the Earth and the object that's in an elevated position, which means if I'm going to use gravitational potential energy, the Earth has to be part of our system. So before we get into that, there are two kinds of cons or forces that we consider either conservative or non-conservative. Non-conservative, very easy. It's basically any force that's not conservative. And there's only two conservative forces that you're going to see in Physics 4A, gravity and the elastic force from a spring. Conservative force really has two main characteristics that are important. One, the work done by a conservative force is path independent doesn't matter how you get from your initial to your final position, just where you start and where you finish. And what's important for this chapter is any conservative force can have a potential energy associated with it. But we define the change in potential energy by negative the work done by the conservative force. So we don't really care about the initial potential energy in terms of the value. What we usually care about is how much does the potential energy change? And how much potential energy changes for a conservative force is equal to negative the work done by that conservative force as the object goes from its initial to its final position. So again, like in this case, when the object increases in elevation, one, the work done by gravity is negative because the displacement is straight up by delta y but the force of gravity, mg, is straight down. So when an object goes straight up, delta y is greater than zero. The work done by gravity, in this case, is negative. So the change in potential energy, the change in potential energy, which is negative the work done, has to be positive. So as an object moves straight up in the air, the change in potential energy, the change in gravitational potential energy is positive, but the work done by gravity during that increase in elevation is negative. So from this whole 
definition of the change in potential energy for a conservative force being negative the work done. We have two potential energies that we can look at. One gravitational potential energy, mass times G times the elevation in meters. So M mass in kilograms, G 9.8 meters per second squared, Y the elevation in meters. Super important for gravitational potential energy, you can define Y equals zero anywhere. And then for elastic potential energy, the equation is one half K times delta X squared. K is just a constant called the spring constant, which describes how stiff the spring is. Delta X is how much the spring is stretched or compressed from its equilibrium position when the spring is not stretched or compressed. The big equation that we have for this chapter is the work done by all external forces on a system equals the change in total energy of the system. And now we're looking at four forms of energy. We've got kinetic energy, energy of motion, one half mv squared. We've got gravitational potential energy, energy of an object in an elevated position, mgy. We've got elastic or spring potential energy, one half k delta x squared. And we have how much the thermal energy changes which is the force of kinetic friction times the displacement over which it acts. And let me just say, if we have rolling friction, it's force of rolling friction times the displacement. If we had air resistance, it would be the force of air resistance times the displacement. We're generally just looking at kinetic friction. Three important points. One, since potential energy is an interaction between two objects, I can't have a single object having potential energy. So if I'm going to use gravitational potential energy as a form of energy, the Earth must be part of the system. If I'm going to include elastic potential energy as one of the energies of the system, then the spring must be part of the system. And if an object heats up, it's never just one object heating up. It's always two because of friction between two objects. So if I push the crate across the floor and there's friction, the crate's going to heat up, but so is the floor. If I'm going to include thermal energy, this delta change the thermal energy term. All righty. All objects that heat up must be part of the system. So when you're doing these problems in this chapter, First thing you want to do is define your system. If you want to include gravitational potential energy, the Earth has to be part of the system. If you want to include elastic potential energy, the spring has to be part of the system. If you want to include thermal energy, anything that heats up has to be part of the system. Then you really want to look at your external forces. And the work done by all external forces will equal the change in your system's energy. Now, let's just look at same sort of simple problem, two different ways. Let's say I have a ball that's at an elevated position. Let's just say it's at a height of like two meters and I drop it and it's going to fall. I wanna know what is its final speed right before it hits the ground after falling some distance. Well, I have two obvious choices. I can define my system as just the ball or the ball plus the earth. If I define my system as just the ball, one, once I let a ball go and there's no air resistance or friction, the only force acting is the force of gravity. But the force of gravity is really the Earth pulling down on the object. So if my system is just the ball, gravity then is an external force. So then if I look at the work done by all external forces equals the change in energy, I can't, I, I can't include gravitational potential energy if the Earth's not part of the system. And there's no springs, and that's not even worth learning about that. So what I have is the work done by external forces equals the change in kinetic plus the change in thermal. And if there's no air resistance or friction, change in thermal energy is zero. So what I basically get is, in this case, gravity is an external force, which is changing the energy of the system by increasing the ball's kinetic energy. And what I ultimately get is how much the kinetic energy changes is equal to negative mg delta y, which is the work done by gravity. But again, in this case, delta y is negative because the ball is decreasing in elevation. 
So gravity in this case, this negative mg delta y comes from the work done by gravity term. And now let's look at the same thing, but now let's consist, consider our system the ball plus the earth. Well, now the only force of gravity in the system is an internal force because it's the earth pulling down on the ball and the earth and ball are both part of the system. So now again, when I look at my big energy term, the work done by all external forces equals the change in energy. Four forms of energy I could consider. Change in kinetic energy, change in gravitational potential energy, which I can now consider because the earth is part of my system. There's no spring, so forget about elastic potential energy. There's no friction or air resistance, so there's no thermal energy. Well, gravity is an internal force, so there's no external forces acting at all. So the work done by external forces is zero, and that equals the change of my kinetic energy plus the change in my gravitational potential energy. What I end up with is the change in kinetic energy plus the change in gravitational potential energy equals zero. I end up with the change in kinetic energy being equal to negative mg delta y, the same thing I got before. So you can define your system however the hell you want, but just be consistent. Anything that's not part of the system exerting a force on the system is an external force. If you want to include gravitational potential energy, include the earth as part of your system. If you want to include elastic potential energy, include the spring as part of your system. And if you want to include thermal energy, anything that heats up has to be part of the system. So a quick little example problem that I did, and then uh, we'll just sort of call that the recap. If I can get Zoom to sort of convert the video and get it back to me, I will upload it. If not, I apologize. And yeah, I really hate that that happened. So in this problem, Actually, let's look at problem 1013, because that's a really interesting problem. You've got a cannon tilted up at a 30 degree angle, fires a cannonball at 80 meters per second from atop a 10 meter high fortress. What is the ball's impact speed on the ground below? And did I do that over here? Yeah. So I did this problem, and this is a great problem because it also sort of reviews kinematics. So let me just say you could figure out this problem not using energy at all, but just using projectile motion. We basically have an object which is being launched with an initial speed of 80 meters per second from an initial height of 10 meters at an initial angle of 30 degrees. And we can totally figure out what the speed before it hits the ground is at using projectile motion. But we're going to use conservation of energy. I'm going to define my system as the ball plus the earth. Now I'm looking at this after it's already launched. So something gave it an initial speed, but now we're looking at it after it's launched. There's no air resistance, no friction. The only forces acting on it are the force of gravity. And so there's no external forces. My initial height depends upon where I define y equals zero. I have two choices that make sense, be either where it starts at or where it finishes at. I'm going to define y equals zero at the ground. So my initial height is 10 meters per second. My initial speed is 80 meters per second. I want to know what is my final speed when it's at a height of zero meters. Now, here's the form of the equation that I think I personally tend to prefer. So let's just go real quick, where did this come from? So this equation up top one, the work done by external forces is the change in energy. Change in kinetic plus change in gravitational potential plus change in elastic potential plus change in thermal. Well, let me just write out all the delta terms. Delta is always final minus initial. Change in kinetic energy is K final minus K initial. Change in gravitational potential energy is final minus initial and so on. One note, we never write this change in thermal energy as final minus initial because in general, we don't know how much the thermal energy started with or ended with. I don't know how many joules it started with or ended with, but what I can tell you is how much the thermal energy increased because of friction. So that's why we never write an E final and E initial for thermal energy, just how much it changed. Well, if I take all of these initial values and move them onto one side and all the final values, 
here's the equation that you end up with, is the work done by all external forces plus the initial kinetic, plus the initial gravitational potential, plus the initial elastic potential energy equals the final kinetic energy plus the final gravitational potential plus the final elastic potential plus any change of thermal energy. So going back and using this form of the equation, there are no external forces, so the work done by external forces is zero. This object or this system doesn't have a spring, so I don't need to worry about the initial and final elastic potential energies. This ball is ending up at the ground level where I defined y equals zero, so my final gravitational potential energy is zero. There is no air resistance or friction, so the change in thermal energy is zero. So what I basically get is my initial kinetic energy plus my initial gravitational potential energy equals my final kinetic energy. In essence, the ball is losing potential energy as it decreases in elevation, but it's gaining kinetic energy. So the sum of kinetic plus potential is not changing. Initially, it's kinetic plus potential. At the end, it's all kinetic. So what I get is, 1 half mv initial squared plus mgy initial equals 1 half mv final squared. Solve for v final, plug in your values, which you're going to get is 81 meters per second. One quick interesting note that I presented during lecture. Notice this answer does not depend upon theta. So if instead of 30 degrees, let's say I used 45 degrees or 50 degrees or 0 degrees, or 90 degrees, you're going to get the same exact answer each case. Why? Kinetic energy only depends upon speed, not velocity. It doesn't matter what angle I launch this at, these all have the same initial speed, which means they all have the same initial kinetic energy. Well, they all start at the same height, so they have the same initial gravitational potential energy, which means once they all reach the same level, here y equals zero, they all have lost the same amount of gravitational potential energy, so they've all gained the same amount of kinetic energy. So a challenge I gave the class is, you can solve this problem, like I said, using projectile motion. And if I want to know what is the speed right before it hits the ground, remember speed is always the square root of vx squared plus vy squared. Now these are all going to hit the ground at different times, they're going to have different values of Vx and different values of Vy, but when you go and you calculate the final speed, everyone will have exactly the same final speed regardless of what angle it's launched at. I think that's pretty damn cool. Okay, that is sort of the recap of the lecture that I gave this morning. Again, I'm sorry for those of you that didn't catch it live, well, live on Zoom. Yeah. I figured out something that uh, hopefully that will never happen again. <sighs> That's it. Stay tuned Tuesday. We're pretty much done chapter 10. I'm just going to do some more example problems and then if we have time move on to chapter 11. If not, then I will do a lecture on chapter 11 on Wednesday. <sighs> that is it. Peace out.